So we've got a hero of the chapter, equipped with thunder hammer and jump pack, ready to fell knights and punch Xenos planes out of the sky. Let's take a look at how to get the most carnage out of him. Hello and welcome back to All Specs Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel, where we're all about leading our imperial forces to purge the Xenos and heretics across the tabletops of the 41st millennium. In this video we'll be continuing my short series on captains. We've compared a bunch of the different captains, looked at their chapter specific options for buffing units and tooling them up to punch the foe to death. In this video we'll be focusing on how to use a smash captain in an actual game of 40k. And sometime in the coming week we'll round up by looking at a few specific smash captain builds. This really is a massive topic and it's been good to finally get to grips with it. Now I've had a fair bit of experience with Smash Captains in games myself, mainly with me running the Blood Angels variety, so I'm fairly familiar with the different options available, what works and what doesn't when you're using them on the field of battle. For the purposes of this video, we'll be assuming a fairly generic Smash Captain setup with a jump pack and a thunder hammer, though obviously with the 10 different flavours of Space Marine Smash Captains we can field, the exact war gear and options that you use may vary chapter to chapter. So without further ado, let's get into it. The first decision that you have when you rock up to a game of 40k with your Smash Captain are any pre-game options you might have, provided he isn't your Warlord and he isn't carrying your one declared relic. You could easily tailor his relics and Warlord traits before the game via the stratagem to get additional relics, or the Hero of the Chapter stratagem to choose a Warlord trait for him. Now this is actually quite powerful. For example, if you're playing a Horde of Orcs, any option to gain additional attacks will probably be useful, and things like the Mastercrafted Weapon upgrades to make his Thunder Hammer damage 4 might be less useful than if, say, you were playing an army of vehicles like Imperial Knights. This could also work with things like mobility options. For example, against Tau, a Blood Angels player might really want to buy in the Angel's Wing as a pre-game relic, as this will ignore Overwatch and give you a really powerful tool to counter one of the tower player's primary strategies. I would certainly have a good think about what relics or warlord traits might be best on your smash captain, and if you do have access to any matchup dependent options, I'd strongly consider trying not to give him anything pre-game so you have the option to buy in the right tools for the job after you've seen your opponent's army. Following this, the main options that you have are whether to start on the board or deploy in reserve. Generally, deploying in reserve is a very reliable way to get into close combat, provided you have some way of making that 9-inch charge significantly better. For example, some chapters have access to boosted charges, such as White Scars have a stratagem that will allow them to roll 3d6 and pick the two highest. Blood Angels can have a 3d6-inch charge when they come in, again for another stratagem, and Raven Guards can re-roll one charge via Raven's Blade, provided you only declare against one unit. There are all sorts of other ways of boosting a charge roll. For example, Black Templars just re-roll all their charges. The Blood Angels Red Thirst will add one to charge distances. You might be pairing up with a Chaplain to gain a plus two inch to charge. All of those will certainly make it more feasible to start in the sky. For armies that don't have that option, starting on the board might be better, as you really don't want your fighty character to come down nine inches from the enemy's army and then just get shot off the board the next turn if he fails a charge. Another consideration as to whether to start on the board or not is how many screening units the enemy has. If you're playing a massive horde of plague bearers or guardsmen or something, there's a very real chance that you're never going to get anywhere close to anything you'd like to hit with the Smash Captain by starting in reserve. Turn 1, they can just fan out all of their models and deny you from coming in anywhere on their half of the board at all. I've got very used to doing this whenever I'm playing horde style armies, as I know how frustrating it can be to have your Smash Captain have to come in to just beat up some guardsmen or light infantry models, and it is surprisingly easy to do if you spread out your models to their maximum unit coherency. If you do choose to start on the board, some chapters have pre-game movement options that you can take advantage of. For example, Raven Guard have their Infiltrators movement, and Blood Angels can use Forlorn Fury if you're using a Death Company Smash Captain, both of which can get them up the board, ready to charge turn 1. Raven Guard also have the Master of Ambush trait, which could get a Smash Captain up the board in the enemy's face, along with an elite unit of their choice. If you're starting back in the deployment zone, you'll probably want to screen them well from enemy shooting. You don't want them right at the very front for them to be gunned off the board by minimal anti-infantry fire. Also definitely consider flyers and snipers. 
You don't want to lose one just because you've left a big enough gap for a flyer to move just next to them and then target him with a whole bunch of anti-tank weapons. If the enemy has significant snipers, strongly consider starting out of line of sight. You'd be surprised how easy a smash captain can go down if the opponent rolls a bunch of sixes with some sniper weapons that cause mortal wounds. That'll cut straight through a storm shield. Smash captains, being captains, also have an aura buff. You might have a re-roll ones aura, or if you've been extravagant and paid for the chapter master bonus on them, then they will significantly buff the damage output of the units all around them. It might well be worth moving them up the board alongside some heavy firepower to take advantage of that boosted shooting, even if your primary concern is to get your captain into close combat. Of course, you can completely reverse this around. They could be primarily there to buff the shooting of the units around them and also provide a very nasty counter charge threat should the enemy get too close. Either way, the captain does have a lot of synergy with the units around him. If you are moving him up the board to engage the enemy solo, you'll certainly be wanting to make the best use you can out of ruins and terrain. Being infantry models with a fly keyword, they can get all over ruins very easily and should be able to hopefully block line of sight from the majority of the enemy's army, provided you're not playing on a table that's completely open and barren. There might be an element of being able to hop cover to cover, and engage enemy threats that are charging towards the midfield. If you're starting in reserve, typically you're going to be coming down turn 2, though Blood Angels and Raven Guard can do a sort of pseudo-reserve deep strike, either via upon Wings of Fire stratagem, or the Shadow Step Psychic Power from Raven Guard. Other than this, your choice is going to be to come in either turn 2 or turn 3. Normally, you're going to want to bring in the Smash Captain as early as possible, provided he can get a good target to charge, and he won't be wasted just killing some screening units. Bringing him in turn 2 is typically going to be the most useful if you can, just because if he deletes a big scary enemy threat, then that enemy threat won't have a turn to do more damage to your army. So having a bigger swing earlier in the game is more helpful than having it the turn after. That being said, you have to weigh up if you can actually get to these tough targets. If you can't hit the thing that you most want to kill with a Smash Captain turn 2, it might well be worth waiting till turn 3. But only if you can make sure that the Smash Captain will connect then. If they're going to wait till turn 3 because of screening units, you absolutely need to be confident that those screening units can get taken out by turn 3. Because the absolute worst outcome is that you come in turn 3 and still have to charge some chaff screens. And you may as well have done that the turn before. So at least by turn 3, your Smash Captain's on the table and might well have a charge they can make provided the enemy hasn't been able to deal with them. So it's a trade-off really between making an early impact in the game versus hopefully making a bigger impact in the game later. When you're coming in from reserve, be aware of intercept stratagems, things like Auspex Scan or the Eldar stratagem to shoot a unit that's coming in from reserve when Aphasia can see them. Most of these stratagems say that you have to shoot as if it were the shooting phase, so that means if you have a unit closer than the Smash Captain, they won't be able to be targeted, provided the wording on the rule is like that. So if you have a unit nearer than the Smash Captain, then the Smash Captain will typically be immune to these stratagems. If that's not possible, then bringing them down out of line of sight is usually a good bet, or at least making sure that the units that can see them aren't just going to insta-delete them, as they might not have enough firepower. Finally, you might want to think about what you're dropping alongside the Smash Captains. If you have another close combat unit, or even a shooting and close combat unit that's coming in from reserve, say for example Raven Guard Assault Centurions put in Deep Strike, or Space Marine Terminators coming in from reserve, they'll obviously benefit from the Captain's aura, and possibly even more so if you've upgraded him to a Chapter Master. If you're bringing in multiple Deep Strike threats at once, it might well be worth meeting a Chaplain who's already on the board, for him to cast that plus two to charge litany so that both the captain and their support will benefit from the boosted charge. Having an extra unit nearby can mean that one of the models can tank the overwatch for the others, depending on whether the character or the squad is tougher. A quick mention on shooting, as captains have decent ballistic skill, and some people prefer to run a storm bolter over a storm shield to have some accurate anti-infantry firepower, rather than pay for the slightly more expensive 3-up invul save. The main thing to remember is not to forget frag and crack grenades if you haven't given him any other ranged options. Obviously these will be out of range if you're bringing him in from reserve, but if you're starting on the board, or you survive to charge again the next turn, don't forget to throw in a cheeky crack grenade as a hard target. There will certainly be times when a lucky shot is the difference between success and failure. On to the combat phase now then. As captains have such a small base, it's usually very easy to break line of sight to the target that you're charging at. If you can, then this is great, as it denies overwatch for free. 
So when you're looking at drop sites for captains coming in from reserve, certainly think about putting them either in cover or out of line of sight if you can manage it. There are other mechanisms to deny Overwatch, such as the Blood Angels' Angel's Wing. Raven Guard have either a Relic or a Warlord trait that can, and there are plenty of other options, such as Suppressors, for example. The other options are to charge with another unit first, say something tough like a Rhino, or just to not charge the thing that you're most scared of overwatching, just charge something else, kill it, and then you could maybe pile into that big threat so it either has to fall back and not shoot, or if it stays in combat, then you can maybe smack it next turn. Smash Captains should typically charge every single target within range that they are safe to do so, the only drawback really being Overwatch and how much of it they want to take. If you're running the Blood Angels Smash Captain with the Angel's Wing, then absolutely every charge phase, just declare a charge on every single unit that is within 12 inches. It means that if things go well, you'll be able to hit things as much as you want, and it also means that you have the most movement options, there are no units that you need to keep outside of 1 inch of, and if you roll a low number for the charge, then you will have guaranteed declared on the unit that's closest to the smash captain, if that's the difference between him getting in or not. You should certainly consider using any boosted charge mechanics that you can, particularly if you're coming in from Deep Strike and the result is actually in question. As we said, the White Scars have their 3d6 inch and pick the highest stratagem to charge, Blood Angels their 3d6 inch charge, and Raven Guard has the Raven's Blade to re-roll the charge provided you only pick one unit. If this is going to be the difference between potentially winning or losing the game, you absolutely need to make sure that charge goes off. It might well be worth a command point beforehand to stop a disaster happening. Finally, you can be charging alongside other units, so you might well be able to buff them. It's worth thinking about either keeping character auras together, say if you're charging with a captain and a lieutenant, or snaking back one unit of a charging squad to make sure they're within 6 inches of your captain's reroll aura. When you're picking your units to fight in the fight phase, you'll certainly want to be considering any interruptions that the enemy might do. If you're charging with multiple units, just make sure that your smash captain activates before they are killed by some sort of other scary melee threat, say an Imperial Knight or something that they've charged in to kill. It will be very sad just to have them cut down in their prime before they even get to swing that thunder hammer. Three up or four up invul saves can be very swingy. They can let you tank a very surprising amount of damage, but occasionally you will just roll cold and they'll die to a very low amount of attacks. So I'd never 100% consider yourself safe if you're fighting anything that's reasonably good in melee. Try and make sure those attacks get in first. If you're hitting something like a big vehicle, you can actually gain a whole ton of movement with piling and consolidation. So if you end your smash captain's charge within one inch of the enemy vehicle, but not in base contact, use that three inch pile in movement to go all the way around its hull and just finish very slightly closer to it and then use that consolidate movement to do exactly the same, continue moving around the vehicle's hull or base, and again finish very slightly closer to that vehicle. You can use this to easily gain a good 4 or 5 inches movement to where you want to be each turn. I've used that trick to successfully tie up some Dark Reapers before that were far out of my charge range, just by moving along the base of an Eldar Grav tank via pile-in and consolidation. You want to think about using any strats to buff close combat. For example, Blood Angel's Red Rampage for one command point for D3 attacks is typically a very solid buy. If you're fighting something that absolutely has to go down, then it might even work out less command point intensive compared with using one of the chaps to fight again. If you have engaged multiple opponents, you'll need to weigh up the pros and cons of potentially going to take out two targets or focusing all your attacks on one to make sure it dies. Both strategies could have merit. I usually tend to prefer to split my attacks to give myself the best chance of taking out multiple things, but I'll typically always do the maths first to mean that I have an actual reasonable chance of taking out both targets, because the last thing that you want to do is just to graze a couple of characters and have them swing back at you and kill you for no return. If you have charged multiple hard targets and you're really going very command point intensive, say if you wanted to take out two knights or two Eldar flies in one go, you could declare both as targets plow into one, hopefully kill it with your first activation, and then consolidate to just outside an inch of the next target. Then you could use Honor the Chapter to activate again, and then hit that second target before it's even had chance to hit you. On a fully tooled up Blood Angel Smash Captain, this could easily be used to take out multiple hard targets in one go, just because of the ludicrous amount of damage that they can put out. Honor the Chapter to fight again is a really powerful stratagem. Obviously it costs a lot of command points, but three command points can have a ridiculously high return. 
when used in the right situations, and Smash Captains can often make those situations happen. Similarly to Honor the Chapter, Only in Death Does Duty End is another good option for Smash Captains. If you've stacked multiple combat buffs on them, then paying two command points to strike back at whatever killed them in the fight phase could easily be worth it. Plus it's very satisfying to drag down whichever killed your shiny character off the board, whether it's another enemy hero or an Imperial Knight, or just a bunch of enemy elite infantry. If you're fairly confident that you're going to kill your target, it's certainly worth thinking about where your Smash Captain is going to end up at the end of the phase. As I said, we could use that pile-in and consolidation to try and tie up other enemy units, but don't forget there's always the option of trying to end out of line of sight, or even just in cover for a better saving throw against return enemy fire. Smash Captains have a lot of options with how they position themselves because they have such a small base, so they could easily go to one end of a unit or the other end of a unit, so you really need to think about which will be the most useful to you, after hopefully you've smashed said unit into tiny little pieces. Finally, if you are thinking of consolidating into other units, just one thing to be aware of that I've fallen foul of is the Psychic Power Smite, or any other mechanisms that can dish out mortal wounds to you even when you're in close combat. It can be very annoying thinking that your character has tied up some serious firepower in the next turn, and then only to have some Chaos Psychers blow them to bits with Smite, thereby freeing up the units to shoot in the shooting phase as normal. So watch out for that, and bear in mind that it is a certain possibility if you're facing an army with those options. So I thought we'd end with a few fun stories about how some of the fights with the Smash Captains have gone for me. I had one occasion where a Smash Captain with the Angel's Wing jumped into a Tau Ghost kill and smashed it to bits. Then I had two Riptides fire at it. I passed 15 out of 16 three-up Storm Shield saves, kept him alive, then he jumped into the midst of the Tau Gun line, thereby stopping the overwatch of a Riptide and a big unit of broadsides meaning that the rest of the army could pile in and kill everything. I had a game where the same Smash Captain used On Wings of Fire to jump over to smash to bits a Vendetta gunship with Punisher cannons. He was charged by Guardsmen the next turn to tie him up, so he promptly used On Wings of Fire again to jump up into the sky once more, managed to charge a Lehman Ross, and used the Consolidating trick to go round its hull, and when it died, to pile into another two Lehman Rosses thereby single-handedly stopping three Rosses from getting any shooting in the following turn. That one was pretty game-winning. And finally, possibly for the most destruction any one Smash Captain has caused, was when I was playing against a Ravenwing Landspeeder army in early 8th edition, where the turn after breaking a Dark Talon to bits, my Blood Angel Smash Captain charged two Landspeeders, a Talon Master and Samael. With splitting attacks and Red Rampage, he downed both the regular Landspeeders and consolidated into the Talon Master. He hung on with one wound left against Samael and the Talon Master's return attacks, and then he used Honor the Chapter to activate again and smash up the Talon Master. And then, fortunately enough, Samael also decided to use Honor the Chapter to activate Kill My Smash Captain, after which he used Only in Death Does Duty End to activate again, and piled another eight Thunderhammer attacks into Samael, killing him too, and we decided to call the game there at that point. Sorry about that, Jake. Under the circumstances, you are very sporting indeed. So overall, Smash Captain use isn't the most straightforward, and there are a lot of options that you can take, but it's knowing which ones to use and when can be the difference between whether they carve a merry path through the enemy army, or meet an untimely end to some enemy sniper fire or overwatch long before they make combat. To round off my short series on Captains, we'll be looking at some specific Smash Captain builds next time, so feel free to subscribe to Auspets Tactics if you'd like to see that. Thanks very much for listening. I'll look forward to seeing you guys in the next video. And if you're finding my content useful, feel free to support me on Patreon, the voluntary subscription service where you can give channels you find useful a little financial support to help us keep doing what we do. I'm looking forward to making the next video, so I look forward to seeing you guys there.